morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see each and every one of you here. It's good to see Leonard. Is your entire family here? All except one. All except one. Everybody else, would you introduce your family here? <laughs> Who, me? Sure, sure. Well, this is Fayette, our oldest. This is our second, Yolanda. That's her husband, Richard. And this is the youngest. And her two daughters, Carly and Ashley. Welcome. If I'm not mistaken, you're all from where it's hot. Where it's hot. Yeah. Well, good for you. <laughs> you win. Well, from here. If you take your bulletin, there's uh, some announcements I'd like to expound on a little bit. First of all, Camp Pahocha, the beginning camp, second one. And Lucas and Lowell are here, and both are feeling a little tough. The annual camp colds and flus are there. As you can imagine, when you bring kids in from all over for a week of real close contact, lack of sleep, probably not eating the way they would at home, eventually it catches up and it has. You keep not only the camp in general, but also the uh, health of the counselors and staff to be appreciated. Got a phone call from Joan this morning. She and Kevin are both fighting the same stuff, apparently. She wanted me to inform the church. There's a young lady that had been coming to her church here off and on with Renna by the name of Renna Hathaway. Her mother passed away this past week, and she wanted the church to be aware of it. If you know her and know of her and would like to send her a card, her address there at Edmore is on the screen. You would uh, feel led to send her a card. That would be good. And uh, we just want to let that know that we haven't forgot about her as a church. Are there any other announcements? I see Maple Manor at 2 o'clock today. Anything else? Have I missed anything? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Lord, it is good to be in your house to worship you. We see the uh, beauty outside, the sunshine, the breeze, the comfort of being outside in your nature. We look across the fields of our grain, we see them waving. We uh, see the, almost looks like water when it's breezy, and we see the wheat waving. It's just, for us farmers, pretty. We, thank you for that. we ask, Lord, that our worship here would be pleasing to you, would be genuine, would be centered on you, who you are, what you do, and that we would take our minds off what we are to do and what we have to do in the weeks and days to come. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. The call to worship from Psalms 95, 1 through 3. O come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to the name of the Psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Stand up and bless the Lord.
Well, good morning. You know, last week I preached on Are You a Speckled Bird? And I played this song, The Great Speckled Bird. And I'm not really sure about this, but it's interesting that more people of the congregation recognize the tune is God made honky tonk angels. <laughs> or did he make them? I can't remember which. He did make honky tonk angels, yeah. So that, that same tune was used in a lot of songs. In the 1952, it was, it was used in God did make honky tonk angels. Kitty Wells made it popular, I think. And then, but in 1925, the Carter family also used that same tune in, to the song called Thinking of Those Blue Eyes Tonight. So interesting that um, nobody knew the spiritual version of the song. <laughs> So, you know, I've been just praying about what my next sermon or sermon series should be, and I was thinking about different topics in books of the Bible, and I thought I would look at something that we all face at one time or another, and that's discouragement. And so, I'm going to begin today, I think we'll have next week, I don't know about the week after that, and it's going to be titled, Dealing with Discouragement. What was sort of interesting to me is I was looking through the Word of God about people who face discouragement, it's like, wow. I really got discouraged looking at all those people being discouraged. There's a lot of discouragement. And uh, it's just a part and parcel, I think, of our humanity. And uh, our text this morning is from Psalms chapter 42. As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and stand before him? Day and night I have only tears for food, while my enemies continually taunt me, saying, Where is this God of yours? My heart is breaking as I remember how it used to be. I walked among the crowd of worshipers, leading a great procession to the house of God, singing for joy and giving thanks amid the sound of great celebration. Why am I so discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise Him again, my Savior and my God. Now I am deeply discouraged, but I will remember you, even from distant Mount Hermon, the source of the Jordan, from the land of Mount Mazar. I hear the tumult of the raging seas as your waves and surging tides sweep over me. But each day the Lord pours his unfailing love upon me, and through each night I sing his songs, praying to God who gives me life. O oh God, my rock, I cry, why have you forgotten me? Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by my enemies? Their taunts break my bones. They scoff. Where is this God of yours? Why am I discouraged? And why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. One of the things I love about the book of Psalms is the, is the honesty that's in it, because we're not always very honest as, as uh, Christians. And we're not always honest with ourselves or with God or each other about what we feel and what's going on inside of us. And I appreciate that it, the book of Psalms is a, is a book of prayer, it's a book of praise, it's a book of hope and trust, but it deals real honestly with the fact that sometimes we face really difficult situations and we have really discouraging times in our life. And to have the emotion of discouragement is there's nothing wrong with it at all. It's part and parcel of our being human. So. As an example today, I wanted us to look for a moment before we look into that scripture a little bit more. As an example, I wanted to talk about uh, William Carey, who is called the father of modern missions. And maybe you don't know who he is, but uh, I, I, like his, I like him as an example because he lived a life of service to the Lord. He lived in the, from 1761 to 1834. And I just want to tell you a little bit about him about what he accomplished in the Lord and in the kingdom of God. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about the things that he faced and how he responded to them. So this is a man who was born in, in England. Uh, he went through school until he was 12. And then he was, uh, wasn't particularly strong physically, so he was put in a, a shoe shop to learn the trade of repairing shoes. And while he was doing that, he taught himself Latin, and then he taught himself Greek and Hebrew, French and dust, D Dutch. Eventually, in his life, he learned literally dozens of, of languages. And the reason he's called the father of modern missions is because in his life, 
One of the things that the Lord used him for was to awaken the church to the need to reach all the perishing multitudes of people outside of the developed countries. And so you, it's hard for us to believe now, maybe it is for us who are in, in, interested in missions and stuff, it'd be hard for us to imagine the season that he lived in where the church was indifferent to the perishing multitudes and just, just didn't really care. They just felt like one time he was talking about the need to reach people with the gospel outside of England and an older gentleman told him, listen, Sonny, if God needs help getting the, the heathen, no, if, if God decides to save the heathen, he doesn't need your help. Sit down and shut up, basically. That was, and, that was, and that was one of, the, one of the, the pastor leaders of his time. So anyway, he was greatly used by the Lord to open the eyes of people, especially in England. Most of the Baptist churches can, can thank him for his sacrifice and his service because they're... Their uh, origin is in, the, is in that missionary movement that he kicked off. And his life and ministry inspired, and still does inspire, countless other missionaries. People like Hudson Taylor followed the Lord and into China because of him. He translated the Bible into six languages. He went and moved to India. And he translated the complete Bible into six languages after learning those languages, making grammars for them, doing all the work necessary so that he could convey to people that language first, and then they could learn the Word of God in that language. He also translated parts of the Word of God into 29 other languages. In India, he's quite a famous person even to this day because he didn't just preach the gospel of Jesus Christ there. He was very interested in the effect of the gospel, and he identified himself with the people of India. So he didn't go and live as, a, as like the great white missionary. He went and lived among Indians, loving them and caring for them and being part of their lives and trying to understand how they thought. One day he was walking and he saw a basket hanging in a tree where a baby had been left to die. And the only thing that remained was the skull. The rest had been eaten by ants. And this holy act had been committed with religious fervor by a Hindu mother who thought she was going to keep evil spirits back by murdering her son. And many women made vows, just one little section of a river, not very far from where he lived, they made a vow to the river that if the river would bless that family with two children, then they would present one to the river. And just in a short period of time, more than 100 children were sacrificed. In less than a year's time, 100 children were sacrificed in that river. Kerry looked at that situation, and he investigated not just what was happening, but why it was happening. And he went and talked to people and to find out why. He took surveys. He eventually made a report back to the government because at this time India was divided into separate sections and they were under different uh, colonialists. In this case, he was working under the, the Danish, the Danish government was in charge of that area that he was at. But anyway, he found out that the reason they were doing this was because they had misunderstood a scripture out of uh, the Hindu religion. So he not only wrote this report and got the government to pass a law that made it illegal, he also published a newspaper that spoke to the hearts of ordinary Indian people explaining why it was that they were wrong in doing this and literally turned back a terrible, or at least slowed down a terrible thing going on in that nation. He's also was a, uh, an advocate to stop the practice of burning widows with their dead husband's bodies, it's called satire. I mean, can you imagine that? You'd be praying a lot for your husband's health, wouldn't you? Like, no, honey, do not eat that second piece of pork. And he also was famous for having pioneered, of being a pioneer of education. And when he went, in this time, he started schools for women, which was literally unheard of at the time. So he started women at schools for women, he started schools for the low caste people who were social, socially considered lower and weren't allowed things like education and outcast as well. And these schools he started were free, he raised funds for them, and just in, just in the, the period of time that he was there, there was over 8,000 children had attended there. there. So I think most of all, when we look at his life, besides going and preaching the gospel, besides 
printing the Word of God in all these different languages, besides spending 40-some years of his life where he impacted in a nation, a, a, a group of people, probably most of all his life has inspired tens of thousands of other people to give themselves for the spread of the gospel. Now this guy, his beginnings were great. His life and ministry were filled with discouragement. When he was just a young man, his parents were quite poor. And that never really changed for him. Even as a missionary, he, was, he would always lived as a, as a uh, person who he used the funds that he got to do the mission. He never uh, awarded himself. He ended up dying there in, in India. He was a nominal Christian until he was a teenager. And then he came to a transforming of his soul when he heard the word of God uh, at a Baptist church. When he was 19, he married a woman named Dorothy. She was six years older than he was. The following year, they gave, she gave birth to a daughter, and two years later, that baby died. This is just free, but I thought this would be discouraging. By the time he was 20, by the time he was in his early 20s, he lost all of his hair due to a sickness. And he wore a wig for 10 more years, but when he was on his way to India, he threw the wig in the ocean and never wore it again. I guess he figured the Indians wouldn't care about <laughs> this would be discouraging. He studied to be a pastor, applied for ordination, and part of the process was that you had to preach in front of this group that would approve your ordination, and they were so bored with his preaching, they told him no way. It took him two more years before he was finally allowed to be ordained. And I was thinking about how what would happen had he allowed that discouragement of that moment to stop him and said, okay, I quit then. He was told that he was completely crazy to bring his family to India, to go to India. He fought a real uphill battle trying to get support. He ended up founding his own mission society so that uh, they that would have a heart for the, for the lost outside of England. And when he finally was able to get enough support to go and buy passage on a ship, he and his partners went to go on the ship and they were denied passage because they found out they were missionaries and they hated missionaries. And so his trip was delayed by months and months. They finally got to India, and they had grossly underestimated how much they would need to live. And so he was desperately seeking finances. He ended up working for a rubber company. And uh, he did this all while he was learning the languages and preaching the gospel in villages. Uh, his five-year-old son got a fever within hours, died. And uh, he found out that the Indians viewed them as, this is in the early days, they viewed them as, as uh, strangers. And so nobody would participate in the boy's funeral, wouldn't help him with anything. So he dug his own son's grave and alone as a family they buried that little boy. He became sick just a few days after that with malaria and was sick for weeks. And that was something that happened over and over again. In March of 1812, a fire broke out and burned down their printing house. And you know, you can't imagine this kind of thing in those days. For his printing house to work, he had to have a steam engine brought from another country in a ship. And it took a long time, it took two years to get that steam engine. And can you imagine, right, when you're doing, remember the old fashioned typing? When you, when you printed stuff, I remember in high school, we had a printing class. And the, the type was, was little letters in pieces of metal, and you put them in a block, you know. And so in order to print in all these different languages, they had to have all these type fonts created. And when that fire broke out, it burned their printing press, it burned those, all those fonts, it burned uh, years' worth of manuscripts, of text, a thousand versions of a, of a, a freshly printed New Testament. Can you imagine... Just how that would take the wind out of your sails to have gone to all that labor and then to have it destroyed literally overnight. I was, I was thinking of how, I don't know if you could relate to this, but as a missionary and a pastor, I can certainly relate to this. His son, Felix, was ordained. It was one of the great moments of William Carey's life is to convince his son that God's calling was the greatest thing in the world and to see his son follow in his footsteps. And uh, then to actually get to ordain your own son and send him off to do, to do a mission in Burma. 
and to preach the gospel there. And his son was there for a while, and word came back that he had quit the mission and had taken a job as an ambassador to the king of Burma. And he said in his words, he said that he was devastated. He said, my son Felix has shriveled from a missionary into an ambassador. And I thought, yep, that's how, that's how we would think is, is uh, how would you lower yourself to do something like be an ambassador to a king when you could be an ambassador for the king, right? And he had experienced hardships like his nephew established a rival mission and undermined all their work and relationships in India. And probably the most difficult, most devastating thing for this brother of the Lord was that his wife, Dorothy, began to display signs of mental illness and they steadily grew worse. And she went from having a few problems to having delusions and thinking her husband was cheating on her and screaming at him as he walked out on the road, physically assaulting him to the point where she became completely lost in insanity and had to be locked in a room and sometimes tied down to keep her from hurting herself. And uh, in those days, there was no asylum that you would want to put a loved one into. She ended up dying at the age of 50 from a fever. Yet in all these discouragements, William Carey persevered and he trusted the Lord, working in ministry there for 41 years of, a life, of his life, until he died and was buried in the land he'd come to adopt as his home. We could go on and on about the things that he accomplished and the, the, the trials that he faced, but you can get the idea. But I wanted to share with you, in his own words, how he viewed his life in ministry. Because, you know, sometimes you hear about these situations and we think, wow, that's terrible, but William Carey is, was kind enough to be a, a, a prolific writer. And so we have a lot of his letters and journals and a lot of what he actually said about his life. And I just wanted to share a few, with them, a few of them with you. Because I thought, what, what, a, what a way to see how someone dealt with disappointment in their own life and their ministry. He said, when I left England, my hope of India's conversion was very strong. But among so many obstacles, it would die unless upheld by God. Well, I have God and his word is true. Though the superstitions of the heathen were a thousand times stronger than they are, and the example of Europeans a thousand times worse, Though I were deserted by all and persecuted by all, yet my faith, fixed on the sure word, would rise above all obstructions and overcome every trial. God's cause will triumph. He said, I was young and now I'm old, but not once have I been witness to God's failure to supply my need from the moment I began his work. He has never failed in his promise, so I cannot fail in my service to him. I'm a dreamer and continue to dream of what can and will be. And this is a, a phrase that William Carey is famous for coining. <coughs> Expecting great things from God and attempting great things for God. He said, if my life story is written, credit me for being a plotter. That will describe me justly. Anything beyond this will be too much. I can plot. I can persevere in any definite pursuit. To this I owe everything. And that's actually, I think, a real principle about discouragement, which is that regardless of how difficult the discouraging situation is, just put your next foot in front of the next one and keep doing that. Just keep plodding through, and God will see you through it. He said, all my friends are but one, but he is all sufficient. Talking about the danger of being killed by the heathen, he said, in respect to the danger of being killed by them, it's true. Excuse me. That it's true that whoever does go must put his life in his hand and not consult with flesh and blood. But doesn't the goodness of the cause and the God-given duty on us as Christians in the perishing state of our fellow men loudly call upon us to risk all and to do all in power to share the gospel? To do all in our power to share the gospel. They said, I feel that it's good to commit my soul, my body, and my all into the hands of God. Then the world appears little, the promise is great, and the God in my God and all in God my all sufficient portion. And then he's a lot of other quotes, but I just thought we'd end with this one. The future is as bright as the promises of God. So when you look at this situation and his situation and David's and our own, 
The truth of the matter is that life is about 20% about what happens to us and 80% how we respond to what happens to us. So I want us to consider this. Discouraging times are part of everybody's life. And next week we'll talk, we'll uh, go into more detail about it. And especially we'll differentiate between discouragement and, and depression. But discouraging times come and go. And as William Carey experienced tragedy, catastrophe, his was a discouraging situation. It wasn't that it wasn't discouraging, it was. As David outlined his situation in our psalm reading, his was a discouraging situation. He was on the run. He'd been promised by God that he'd be king. And now he's living as an outlaw. One time he was, he was a, a worship leader in the house of God, and now he's having to hide, and he has to worship God in secret. His enemies are trying to kill him, and he's done nothing wrong. Both these men dealt with their situations by turning to God, not away from him. As I said at the beginning, I like the fact that Dave got, David gave an honest assessment. He was honest with his feelings. He was honest with his prayers. He said, you know, my heart's breaking. I remember how it used to be. That's, one of those, that's a sad, sad sentence in that psalm, isn't it? Because he's looking back and remembering how things were good. He remembers how it was when he was strong, when he was healthy. He remembers how it was when he was loved and adored. And now it's not that way for him. He's having physical problems. He's having emotional problems. He has his friends that betray him. He's being honest. He says, I, I, it, I, I remember what it was like. It, it, I cry when I think about that. My heart's breaking as I remember how it used to be. But he chose to believe that somehow, some way, God would help him through his situation. He said, now I'm deeply discouraged, but I will remember you. He said, why are you discouraged, soul of mine? I like how he talks to himself. He said, has not God always been faithful? I think he probably said, has God not promised his presence? God is faithful. Don't give up, soul of mine. Trust the Lord that the day is coming when you will once again praise him in public. He focused on God and his goodness, not just his situation. In other words, it's easy to look just at your situation when you're, when you're in, in discomfort, when you're, been, when you're discouraged, when you're pressed down. It's easy just to see that. That's why I think this one of the Psalms where it says, I look up for whence cometh my help, right? Sometimes we have to look up past where we're at. He focused on God and his goodness. He said, each day the Lord pours out his unfailing love upon me. So he has a mixture, right? In one part, he's very honest. He says, God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? He's not afraid to tell God the depth of his hurt, the depth of his feeling. He pours his heart out, heart out before the Lord. But he always comes back to the, that he can trust God, that he's going to trust him no matter what. He says, each day the Lord pours his unfailing love upon me, and through each night I sing his songs. He praying to the God who gives me life. So I think when we face dis discouragement, remember to turn to God, not away from him. Be honest with ourselves, be honest about our situation, our feelings, and be honest in our praying. But in the middle of that honesty, even when we're telling the Lord our doubts and our fears and our, our, our situation, let's make sure that we choose to believe that somehow God is going to help us through the situation. Challenge yourself to trust, just like David did, right? He challenged himself. He spoke to himself and said, hey, why are you discouraged? Yet again, I will praise you. The time is coming where this giant is going to be laying down and I will be looking down on him instead of up at him. And I will know that you are my deliverer. So he looked ahead in faith. Challenge yourself to trust. And focus not just on your situation. And I'm not trying to diminish situations. Because I know sometimes those situations are like looming over us. But look beyond that situation. And focus on God and his ability and his goodness and his kindness. Life is about 20% of what happens to us, 80% how we respond to the events. Life happens, how will we respond? Choose to trust the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word and your, <clears throat> your promises to us, Lord, in the, the example we have of David.
We thank you, Lord, for men of God and women of God who have suffered and sacrificed and served and surrendered. Lord, the example that death set for us as well, and that they trusted you regardless of situation or circumstance. They kept their eyes on you. And Lord, we thank you, Father, for that hope that you give us, Lord, that regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the situation, that you will see us through one way or the other. Lord, help us to respond in discouraging situations with praise, with prayer, with trust. Lord, resting on your promises in your word, in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray, Lord, in your name, for those who are facing difficult situations in our family, I hold them before you, Lord. We ask in the name of Jesus that you would bring them, Lord, the songs of the night that your word talks about. Pray, Lord, that you would let them have a sense, Lord, of your overwhelming, unfailing love. Lord, that through their, through their times of pain, through their times, Lord, of difficulties, through their time of questioning, Lord, that you would be their rock, that you would be their refuge, Lord, that you would be our fortress, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give supernatural strength, Lord, that we could rise up, Lord, on wings as eagles in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. In closing, we're going to stand and saying, His strength is perfect.